Thank you, last count, Corla. Uh, this Sunday, March the 8th, is International Women's Day. And I wanted to ask you, are you in any way embarrassed that during four years of your government's tenure, not only have you not lifted a finger in relation to key areas of women's rights that cry out for vindication, but that now your austerity policies are causing immense suffering for women in low and middle incomes, and especially for women dependent on social welfare payments, which your ministry is directly responsible for. Tonisha, how do you feel that the United Nations, a conservative body, last summer had to call out this government for its ongoing maintenance of the Eighth Amendment? They said that the abortion ban and your pathetic Protection of Life During Pregnancy Act was a breach of civil and political rights and that women in Ireland were being effectively treated as vessels. They particularly mentioned the disgrace of fatal fetal abnormalities. And yet last month, Tonish, that you trooped in here with Labour TDs and voted down a bill that could have dealt with that. But apparently that hypocrisy is okay because last weekend at the Labour Party conference, you suddenly decided that you would promise a referendum whenever Labour gets into government at some stage in the future. Now, given that that's not likely to happen in any way, shape or form at any time soon, why not salvage something out of this government for the Labour Party and hold a referendum to repeal the Eighth Amendment along with the other referendums that you're planning in the lifetime of this government? Secondly, Tonish, I'd like you in particular to deal with the growing problem of the feminisation of poverty, which has accelerated under your government. Women have been traditionally lower paid and on lower incomes. But as Minister for Social Protection, you've swung your axe on women in a particularly shocking way. Your cuts to child benefit, a broken election pledge, have taken hundreds of euro out of the pockets of women and their families. But for some inexplicable reason, You've singled out the poorest women and lone parents for particular attack. Your cuts to one parent social welfare payments are nothing short of Thatcherite and have been condemned by Bernardo's and countless other groups. Your rent allowance cuts are making hundreds of women homeless each, each week. So, Tonisha, can I ask you, last year on International Women's Day, you, you made a speech and you said, Quote, we need more women leaders in Sorry. all areas of life. That far too few women are in the room when crucial decisions are being made. But Tanishta, why, when you're in the room, is this happening to women? Thank you. Why, as the most powerful woman in this country in politics, are these things happening? You also said to women to do one thing every day that scares you. Well, believe me, Tonishta, they're doing things every day that they're terrified of, thanks to your cuts, making their lives a misery. Question, please. Tonishta, in relation to International Women's Day, my question is this. I know where I'll be spending it. I will be at a rally organised by the Rosa Group at the Spire. But where will you be? Because two years ago, you spent International Women's Day with Christine Lagarde, who's a well-heeled head of the IMF, which has plunged millions of people into poverty, especially women. It's a far cry, would you not agree, Tanishta, from the labour movement tradition, which, which started International Women's Day in the first place, begun by garment workers in 1909 in the US, and carried on by German socialists. So, Tanishta, will you celebrate International Women's Day by calling off your economic war on women? And will you hold a referendum to repeal the Eighth Amendment, which is so badly needed by Thank women? Thank you, uh, Tanishta. Please we'll try and keep to the time. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Well, first of all, uh, can I just say that the women who are my heroes deputy are the women who look after their families, who look after their parents, who go out to work and who make a life for themselves, for their partners and for their children. And there's a saying in Swahili that women hold up half of the sky. And I don't know if you've ever had an opportunity uh, to uh, be aware that in terms of women's responsibilities in this world, 
the women, as I said, who every day look after their families, uh, their partners, their children, their elder parents, I think they should be all of our heroes. Those of us who are elected to politics as women, it's an enormous privilege to serve, and I do hope to see uh, a higher number of women participating. That's part of uh, the development of democratic societies, and I think it's something to be welcomed, including your own presence uh, in this House here. In relation to the social welfare system, and you had a question on this earlier this morning, uh, as I told you, in the studies which were carried out uh, by the ESRI and which was published a couple of months ago, it shows that in fact uh, women in fact benefit slightly more from our social welfare system and if you think about it you will realise why. Notwithstanding all the work and contribution that women make, uh, women live longer uh, than men in statistical terms uh, by a couple of years. As a consequence, for instance, in terms of our pension system, and particularly for women who've retired on a state contributory or a non-contributory pension, their, their actual benefit uh, from uh, the 6.7 billion, 6.7 billion that this country will spend this year on pensions for retirees, uh, a, a slightly greater proportion of that uh, goes to women uh, than to men. But I'm sure you would endorse that. Secondly, in relation to the ESRI study, and I went through it in detail for you this morning, even though I think you quibbled a little bit at the study, uh, but it was published, and the ESRI is a recognised and acknowledged uh, research institution. It showed that, uh, in fact, uh, women uh, actually do again slightly better, but that across households, and a lot of women are in a household where two adults, one man, one woman, uh, that household income is distributed evenly. And therefore, the ESRI found that there was no measurable difference between women and men. In relation to your third point, uh, in respect of uh, changes uh, in relation to lone parents, my objective is to help people to actually get into work either on a part-time or a full-time basis. And um, the way to do that and to get a well-paying job is to get access to opportunity in terms of education, training and uh, work experience. And we have had a tradition in this country going back to the early 1970s when the first uh, payments for lone parents uh, were introduced of leaving, leaving people welfare dependent for 18 to 22 years on social welfare. We're changing the rules to allow people to combine getting a social welfare income or a family income support or the new back to work family allowance which will give any lone parent going back to work an extra 30, 30 euros per week, per week per child, you, an additional 30 euros per week per child. And as the studies in relation to this year's budget show, in fact, uh, we have also increased child benefit for every child in this country by five euros a month. So I'm happy to say that as Thonisha, I have actually prioritised getting people back to work because when people get some work, part-time or full-time, they're at risk of poverty falls by well over 60%. Getting a job is the best way out of poverty and I've never made a secret that getting a job, getting an education, getting opportunities in life are at the heart of the Labour Party's Thank policy. Thank you, Donisha. Can I just say the House that, uh, sorry, supplementary, sorry, members, su supplementary questions and replies are one minute, please. One minute. Um, Deputy Rule Coppinger. Tanisha, Tanisha, the, the, uh, the... Deputy Coppinger. The ESRI report that you quote didn't refer to social welfare cuts at all. It wasn't a study of that. 
And it, and it didn't actually conclude that there was no impact on women. It actually concluded that there was an impact on women who were in a relationship. But the study that I'd like to refer you to, and I'm, I'm sure you're not contradicting it because it's well known, is the one done by the National Women's Council. Um, and it concluded that equality had been cast aside in the, during the crisis. Lone parents, low paid and the poor were special targets for raising cash to recapitalise the banks. Mother-headed households were more likely to be in debt for gas, electricity and rent. Women were you know, more likely to be paid, paying for the crisis. Now, I, I won't go into it. You, you know well what it is, Minister. I'd like you to go back to the two specific issues I raised of lone parents and the Eighth Amendment, which you studiously didn't mention whatsoever. First of all, in lone parents, you broke, this is the second promise you've broken to women. First of all, you, you promised you wouldn't cut child benefits, you had loads of posters just before the election, you cut it. You took ten, you gave back five. Secondly, you promised last July you wouldn't proceed with these cuts to lone parents unless there was Scandinavian childcare in place in society. There's no Scandinavian childcare. I'm sure a lot of women would like to go out to work, be it part-time or full-time, but when you're a one parent, it's even more difficult. You're turning seven-year-olds into latchkey kids. And parents are meant to be able to find somewhere from half one, when a seven-year-old gets off school, to six o'clock. They'd want to be earning a whopping uh, income like yourself, Minister, to do that. Thank but just you. finally, in relation to the Eighth Thank Amendment, I'm on a worker's wage, you're not. In relation to the Sorry. Eighth Amendment, can you please answer the question why, in the past, people would have expected Order. that the Labour Party, at least on social issues, if nothing else, would garner something from a coalition on popular government? Why won't you hold a referendum this year, not at some stage in the future, because we all know you won't be in the next government, so therefore it's a useless promise. Do it now and give women the rights that they deserve Thank you, under the Eighth Amendment. Tarnister. Uh, first of all, uh, you asked. Well, sorry, the members, please. Tarnish has the floor. Sorry. Order, please. Order. Tarnish. I've called the Tarnish. I've called the Tarnish. Uh, at the Labour Party conference uh, this week, uh, this weekend, very successful, very, uh, very worthwhile conference. Pity you weren't there, actually, but maybe you were outside. Um, anyway, uh, the uh, the delegates agreed. Uh, that at our, in terms of our platform for the next election uh, that we will be seeking to repeal the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution because the legal advice to us and you know, I, I, I can only go on the legal advice that we get is that to deal with the very distressing issue of fatal fetal abnormality uh, that a constitutional uh, change is required and when we go to the people we will ask people in our uh, platform for election to in fact endorse a proposal that the Labour Party will seek to have implemented to have a referendum on the Eighth Amendment. Secondly, secondly, you asked me earlier, and I forgot to answer you, where would I be on it in, ter in, uh, in terms of the celebrations for International Women's Day? Well, I would be in Maynooth College uh, with, uh, with organisations like Trocra, uh, uh, celebrating in terms particularly of women in developing countries their achievements uh, as women in terms of building, uh, building uh, economic independence and uh, building small, and medium and large businesses uh, for themselves and for their families. I'll also be, and uh, one of your colleagues might be interested in this, I hope also to have some time to celebrate with On Cusong, uh, which is a marvellous organisation based in Tala, providing education for the community. Thank you, Donna. And last year, when I met Madame Lagarde, uh, the head of the IMF, uh, I actually brought with me and invited to be with me, and you may object to this, people involved, women involved in Ireland, in business, in areas like uh, carers associations, in areas like education, 
in areas like some of the leading women doctors, some of the leading women doctors who work in this country. Order. But the person who probably, the person who probably spoke best, going back to my comment about the women who are my heroes, was the woman who had spent her life working, and several other women, as carers, caring for individuals from their families and from their communities. And Christine Lagarde spent a lot of time with uh, women telling their story of what it's like to be a woman in modern Ireland. And it's important that women share their stories. So I hope that this International, uh, International Women's Day, that women in Ireland uh, will uh, get the same opportunities, and certainly in terms of the events uh, that I'm going to go to, I hope to be able to celebrate with women who are so successful, so committed, but particularly who are committed to this country, to their children and to their families. Thank you, Senator. That concludes leaders' questions.